Hey YouTube, we're back with another History Teacher Reacts video. Today we are hitting up episode two of Extra History series on the history of space travel. Uh, if you missed out on part one, um, I want to check that out first. If you want to see it in order there. But today we're going to hit up episode two, which it looks like is titled Revolutions. All right, before we begin, original video is down below. Make sure you click on that and check that out. Give them the full view, subscribe, like, all that good stuff. And then come back on over and love to have you around our community. Hit the sub button, enable those notifications, and check out the links down underneath in the description for some other awesome stuff. All right, let's go ahead and get going. History of a Space Travel. Episode Constantinople two. has fallen. The last embers of Rome have guttered out. But from this ending comes a new beginning, a rebirth. The Romans. Did the Romans go to space? I think they went to space. This series is sponsored by the awesome folks at Digital Extremes, developer of the free-to-play co-op shooter Warframe, Ooh, that also just games. so happens to take place in Something space. Something my gaming channel. <laughs> what are the odds? Link down below. So after this episode, check out the game at the link below. As refugees fled the shattered Byzantine Empire, they brought with them texts and learnings that had been hoarded over the ages. The legacy of ancient Rome, the scholarship of Greece, the wisdom of the Islamic empires. Now, the Ottoman Empire, though, also uh, kept a lot of stuff. It's really the Islamic world that was preserving a lot of that stuff. Now, as compared to Western Europe, Eastern Europe, of course, was still living through the Roman Empire in their minds. But yeah, the Islamic empires, as they're saying here, um, really were the torchbearers for a lot of the thought that was coming out of ancient Rome and carry that on. All of these things they took with them to the nearby Italian peninsula. And with this infusion of ideas, a remarkable change began to occur. A Europe that had languished for a millennium trying to recapture the glory of the old Roman Empire began making startling leaps forward in the arts, in the sciences, and in production. But for time. our tale of how humanity reached out to the stars, we must really begin with a man named Copernicus. This is, yeah, sort of scientific revolution, part of, I guess, the Renaissance as it's going forward. Uh, this, a lot of people put basically the immediate effects after the fall of Constantinople with the Age of Exploration, the Renaissance really uh, getting going as kind of the birth of the modern world. It's a pretty Eurocentric point of view that's kind of getting away from a little bit, but at least from the Western world, it looks to be kind of like a, uh, this is like a new era for sure of what's about to be happening in this, starting in this century. Timidly, almost hauntingly, afraid of its reception more from the intellectual community than the church, this man put out a new idea, a new theory in astronomy, one that contradicted everything that Ptolemy mm -hmm. had said. Ptolemy. One which reordered the very worlds. So Ptolemy was an um, ancient Roman um, astronomer, and why they reference him a lot is he kind of had this idea of, yeah, this like rounder Earth, and stuff revolves around it, and for the most part with what was mathematically and, and, and observationally available to them, the, the, the mathematics worked for a lot of the close observable stuff, right? Um, and so that that kind of supported geocentricism. Earth is the center of the, the solar system for the entire Middle Ages. Now it also, and I may, they'll probably get into this, I'm sure, but it also kind of fit in with what the Catholic Church was also believing, um, kind of as a, as a, like a God-created universe and everything's built kind of for the Earth and stuff moves around. It kind of fit in with that theology and it kind of came part of the theology. Uh, but of course, we know this stuff is going to just upend the whole traditional thought of the solar system he proposed that the sun not the earth might be at the center of the universe now he wasn't the first one to say something like this even in ancient sure. greece some had proposed such a notion but he was the first to back it up with fairly rigorous that's math. the big thing right his system was simpler than the ptolemaic Evidence. system it didn't have to have epicycles those wheels within wheels and it got results because that the epicycle thing doesn't make it doesn't make sense it doesn't have a purpose so the thing that people were that knew that was kind of weird was the retrograde motions, right? Uh, you'd see Mars or whatever, which you can see with the naked eye going in one direction. Then it would seem to come back another way. And what they thought is that Mars, like these planets, they were going in circles while going in circles around the earth. And that doesn't really make a lot of sense necessarily, but it was, I guess you could, you could say it was right. But now you have something to back it up and then, yeah, you find out, well, they're going in circles. Yeah, they are. But, 
not just around some random fixed point, it's actually around something else, and it's not the Earth. ...system. It didn't have to have epicycles, those wheels within wheels, and it got results that were basically as accurate. Encouraged by everyone, from members of the church to his own pupils, in 1543, in the final days of his life, he published his book, and not many people cared. He printed 400 copies, and didn't even sell out of the original print run. But those few copies that were bought, were bought by the right people. And his ideas started to take root with some of the most forward-looking astronomers in Europe. I mean, you'd think with to, to know that language of mathematics, there's probably only a very few elite people that could, at this time, could even could even digest that like it's like speaking another language so the common people aren't gonna this isn't gonna make sense to them with the um, first off literacy rates still stink even though we're now in the printing press era but uh and then but to, to speak that mathematical language would have been also very rare so commoners aren't gonna buy into this it's not gonna be something they can observe and it's just you know what i mean just hearing this it's gonna be again like speaking another language but you can see how some some of the more educated elites uh that can speak those mathematical languages if you will um, those are going to be the first people to, to, to jump onto this. Then, boom. Literally. In 1572, something unthinkable happens. A new star appears in the sky. Supernova? Now, today, we know it was a supernova. But to astronomers at the time, it was a revolution. The famously gold-nosed Tycho Brahe, who, get this as a little aside, lost part of his nose in a duel with his cousin because the two were arguing about who was the better mathematician <laughs> at a very alcohol-fueled engagement Nerd party, fight. took Sweet. copious notes and released a treatise on this new star to the world. He proved it was no atmospheric phenomena, but truly something happening out past the moon. I wonder what they thought about this. I wonder what people thought at this point when something like that would happen, a new star. What other recorded events you have that? What would be their explanation from them? And this was earth-shattering. Why? Well, remember how last episode we talked about Ptolemy's hang-up with the celestial bodies being perfect, and that being the whole reason he thought they had to travel in perfect circles? Well, that perfection was tied to an old Aristotelian notion that the stars were immutable. After all, if something was by definition perfect, it couldn't change. And that quest for per perfection, you think about it intellectually, is very lazy. Because it's like, if it's perfect, then, all right, we're done. We don't have to, like, challenge it. You don't challenge something that's perfect, which is the only way you get scientific progress, is if you challenge something. You never assume perfection or 100% um, explanations, right? But going back to, like, Hellenistic society, Greco-Roman, that was, like, a thing, this pursuit of perfection. It was, like, a part of their culture. Otherwise, it would no longer be perfect. Q-E-D. Yet change had occurred that had been proven beyond doubt. But even Tycho Brahe wasn't ready to wholeheartedly embrace cool, Copernicus's notion that the sun was at the center of the solar system. That would take another man. Galileo Galilei. You Magnific see how these guys are building upon each other? They're often students of each other's work. They'd have it, you know, someone would propose something, and then they'd provide some more mathematics or observations to prove it or change it up because... Uh, I believe even Copernicus, though, said that stuff went around the the sun, like stuff's going around the sun, but I'm pretty sure he said it was circular, like perfectly circular, and is it, I think it's Kepler that says, no, it's actually not like that, it's um, elliptical. I gotta remember getting, the, getting them all straight. Go! Wait, what? Galileo Galilei. Magnifico! Yeah. Galileo was the first major astronomer to use a telescope, it. and with this device, he made a whole host of discoveries that would push astronomy forward, including finding non-terrestrial moons, and so showing beyond question that things could orbit bodies other than the Earth. Cool. This led him to defend Copernicus's notion of a sun-centered cosmos, which led him to a friendly discussion of the theological merits of this notion. He's which have to led answer him for into it, being though. the target of the Inquisition, which led him to spending most of the rest of his life under house arrest. Yeah, he was Italian, so he was right at the heart of um, of the church, right, and had where the church had its biggest grasp. Gra grasp where these other guys lived in other parts of Europe. They reached from different uh, countries. Got what, like Poland and uh, German. A lot of it's like Central Europe and stuff like that coming out there. So. Galileo, fortunately, is going to largely be the one to sort of pay the price um, as part of the Inquisition here and suppressing that stuff. So, But Galileo, I mean, you can see what, what changes science is when you have new evidence and 
they came to the point with these observations that you had to be able to see further or being able to see further would give you new evidence and new evidence can sometimes show new things so being able to see uh the 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 patterns of orbit like because uh galileo was the first person to see the moons of jupiter his his telescope were able to see the big four ones right so they can see those orbital patterns you can see it's revolving around jupiter right not around something else so you now it's not just mathematical uh, with what galileo does galileo is putting visual things you can go and see it if you have the right equipment in the end the inquisition forced galileo to recant but it was too late his case was too public, his arguments too well put together. That genie could never be put back in the bottle, no matter how much the Inquisition tried. Well, it's out but it's Galileo out. wasn't only an astronomer, he was also a physicist. And some of his physics influenced a young man named Isaac Newton. Now, we've talked about Newton before on this show, but suffice it to say, he changed everything. He invented calculus, though Leibniz would disagree to help him elucidate his theory of gravity and how it would make the planet's orbits work. Yeah, because Galileo is seeing, in, in a way, like, okay, what is happening? It's observation of what is happening, right? And, um, well, we'll let, we'll let it do it. But there's a difference between, you know, being able to describe something that's happening, and that's different than why it's happening. And that's where a lot of these guys, you get into different um, ideas about about physics and the difference between theories and laws and stuff like that, where it's, you know, it's a description of something rather than like the cause of something. His books, Optics and the Principia Mathematica, serve basically as the foundation of modern physics. And it's going to take a literal Einstein to show him where he went wrong. And with the creation of modern physics comes a subtler idea a shift in the understanding, the belief that, through mathematics and observation, we can truly know the world. This is a revolution. From a world that largely thought that understanding came through revelation and scripture, this changed everything. And the fundamental laws that Newton laid down kicked open the door for practical application. Machines, real machines as we think of them today, powered by steam and driven by coal, would be right around the corner. As new means of production Industrial began to revolution. arise, so did a new hunger for a way to refine that production. Alchemy gave way to chemistry, and rapidly, the first wild chemical theories were brushed aside for the ideas we still accept today. It was an enlightenment, an age where reason dominated, and science and logic looked to be the path to all things. The scientific method had been firmly established, and science is now empirical rather than based on interpretations of ancient texts. It's good, yeah. So scientific method is what a lot of people say is really the what gives birth to the scientific revolution because because of that method of falsification, uh, falsification, sorry, and and um, uh, data driven, not starting with conclusions and stuff like that, really accelerates this, and we find more scientific discoveries since the scientific method than we had pretty much ever before um, and it's still the most reliable source of um, investigation that we have of learning pretty much anything antoine lavoisier gave us an understanding of oxidation and how things burn benjamin franklin established the idea of positive and negative electricity and conservation of charge and adam smith presented the world with an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations Capitalism. providing the basis of classical economic theory and make the heads of state around the world start thinking, though sometimes disastrously, about how to grow their national economies to be mega-producing powerhouses. Then we hit the French Revolution, another moment that transformed the world. You notice how all of this is kind of coming together at the same time, and you have like one, like a way of looking at science and use trying to use that same methodology towards something else. Like the Enlightenment was basically this idea where it's like, okay, you have this like scientific method and you can do the research and you can find more perfect explanations and, 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 and unbiased, like, I don't know, uh, ways to investigate things, even just beyond science. Um, like, okay, we have these physical laws and stuff like that. Maybe there are natural laws, laws that govern human nature. We found them that, that govern like, like physical nature, but human nature. So using, trying to use like a scientific approach to be like, all right, what is the best way to form a society? Uh, what laws govern human nature, right? How, how we act, how we should act. What type of economy is best? What type of government is best? Maybe there is a more logical, rational, scientific approach to these things. And that's what made some of this different rather than just going back on theology or tradition 
was using these new attempts to do that. Now, in a lot of these cases, you don't necessarily find something as clear cut as, okay, gravitational constant 9.8 meters per second squared, it's observable, it's testable, and it's that. It's, it's not going to be, it, it's, you're not going to get that kind of finding necessarily for, okay, is a person naturally good or evil? Like, you're not going to be able, like, you're, you're not going to find those solutions as nice and easy and as precise for, like, those physical questions of physics than you are, like, human nature. That's maybe one thing we learned from the Enlightenment in general. Because it was a revolution in the truest sense. Everything was turned on its head. Kings were replaced with committees. Printing presses were as dangerous as bayonets. And not even the names of the months remained the same. Yeah, French the Revolution. chaos of the French Revolution sped up the world's pace of change. As massive armies had to be deployed, provisioned production processes were improved. As Napoleonic armies broke ranks of ancient monarchies, the ideas of democracy or constitutional constraints began to take hold across Europe. And as battles raged on a scale never seen before, new weapons of war were introduced. One, of course, was the Congreve rocket. The very rocket that Francis Scott Key was talking about when he penned the line, the rocket's red glare in the U.S. national anthem. Inspired by, or arguably reverse engineered from, rockets the Mysore Kingdom deployed against British troops as they tried to stay Britain's ever-growing control over India, these are the first rockets to see serious use in Europe. Who would have thought, you know, these rockets would continue to be developed and start putting people and things into out of our earth and out of our solar system and stuff like that and people could be a part of it crazy huh? the royal navy and the royal marines used them to great effect in napoleonic war and as such they represent the first time rocketry was really studied with the full benefit of enlightenment science and production technology but the revolutionary conflicts also saw another technology that took humanity one step closer to the stars for the first time in human history, an observational balloon was deployed to a battlefield, a mere decade after advances made human balloon travel truly practical. So now, humanity was no longer Keep limited to the terrestrial Keep going plane. up. Once the wars had petered out and Napoleon met his lonely end on the island of St. Helena, the world plowed forward, delivering Sonic. scientific and engineering wonders at a pace never before seen. By the end of the century, fast. electricity was coming into widespread use. The first primitive radio signals had been sent and received, and heavier-than-air flight had moved from a theoretical novelty to the beginnings of an experimental possibility. Aerodynamics were moving forward as a field of research, and gliders carrying human beings saw flight for the first time. But there's one more revolution I want to discuss before we move out of the revolutionary age. The Industrial Revolution. Because we never would have reached the stars without the raw production power this revolution brought. I argue it's easily, uh, if you're counting on one hand, most important things that have happened in history, Industrial Revolution. It began in England with the textile industry in the middle of the 1700s, as machinery began to vastly increase the output of weavers. Soon, new methods of smelting, and for the first time in history, the mass production of chemicals became the norm. While at this same time, a different revolution in production was occurring, one that we don't talk about as much, standardization. Now, imagine a world where all the screws are made by hand, where you might not be able to find two with identical heads or of an identical length. We get into uh, interchangeable parts and stuff like that, so we're gonna get into, yeah, so a lot of like Henry Ford kind of things. Mass production, interchangeable parts, assembly line production, the way we build everything now. Imagine a world where you had to measure every chair you bought to make sure it would fit through your door. Yeah, that's most of history. But with the Industrial Revolution, the idea of setting a standard by which all manufacturing would be done comes into play. And it'll be a huge part Underrated. of what's sometimes called the Second Industrial Revolution that happened toward the end of the century, where railroads and telegraphs connect the world, petroleum starts to be refined, and factories begin their first steps towards the modern assembly line. Yeah. Uh People ask, what, what, do, what do they mean by first industrial revolution and second, second industrial revolution? So first industrial revolution is uh, kind of like they said there, mid-1700s mid with basic uh, textile machines. So Britain, to compete economically with nations like China or India that have larger pay, uh, populations, need labor-saving devices, especially in textiles where a place like India is the leading textile producer um, and had been for all of world history. And so they started with that, so with machines, things specifically where you could weave multiple threads at the same time, where one person using a machine could do the work of many people by hand. 
Now, in the early Industrial Revolution, um, you're still mostly talking human-powered or animal power. So those early machines were, you know, uh, often done by like hand cranks and stuff like that maybe a water frame or water wheel so using water power and the uh the the material of choice was still generally iron okay so you got uh, and coal powered so coal powered steam engines made out of iron or man powered and then in the second industrial revolution which people like to say really is about the 1880s or so those things get replaced steam power gets uh largely replaced by internal combustion engines so uh, and that also with use of uh, petroleum so oil um, and those types of machines okay like an electric machines or internal combustion engines so electricity or internal combustion engines replace steam power and a lot of hand power and then also steel is going to replace iron in a lot of situations which is stronger and things like that so you see this this kind of uh, big thing and then in transportation so that's when you get trains invented where during the first industrial revolution you're still i mean you're starting to talk about early trains and stuff like that but um, um, still a lot of horse and buggy and things like that to transport goods. And then you get uh, trains are going to be repl replaced by trains and, and steamboats are going to be replaced by things like automobiles. But as economies grew in this great era of relative peace and great factories belching black smoke poured more goods into the world than ever before. As steamships crossed the oceans and great empires divvied up the globe, as electric lights began to push back the dark and vaccines began to free us from age-old fears, Mass production the weapons medical. of war also became more destructive than humanity had ever seen. Yeah. So join us next time as the Industrial Revolution leads to an age of industrial war, which, when it lasts over, leads humanity to truly reach for the stars. Your Earth history is fascinating, Nontenno. Yeah. Oh, uh, hey, Lotus. Uh, nice to see you're sticking around for the story. And still rubbing in that whole non-tenno thing. That's nice. Of course. Also, I was getting reports of strange forge activity on this orbiter. Is it malfunctioning? Well, I was inspired by how the Industrial Revolution from truly the enabled eventual space travel. Not to mention I wanted to give Zoe something to ride on. So I used the onboard forge and made this. The activity I charted was far greater than the forging of one domestic drone. It was akin to multiple warframes. Who said anything about one? I am both horrified and impressed at the same time. Yeah, those are both valid responses. While my orbiter is getting super spotless, you should go check out Warframe's upcoming expansion, Imperium. It's taking all the Space Ninja combat that you know and love and doubling down by letting you play co-op ship infiltrations in real time with pilotable railjack combat all across the solar system. But how will these new Tenno find their way to Imperium through all these drones? Good space Roombas. Ridiculous, but effective. Oh. All right, good stuff. Okay, so you can tell with the first two episodes, they're approaching the foundation for things, talking about how our ideas about the construct of the solar system has now changed from ancient times to now kind of the, the, the Renaissance scientific revolution era. And then what's going to even make the real, I guess, uh, studies and, and, and experimentation that we need to do for uh, potential or for space travel eventually is going to be built on industrialization, right? The economies that are produced for that. And then war. Um, looks like they're going to get into war. I mean, a lot of the technologies you're already seeing, like they talk about rockets and how they were used to... Uh, as, as weapons and how that technology is going to be constantly changing and we know about space travel a lot of the rocket technology you know again that could have been used for um, for for fighting right and delivering weapons um, intercontinentally will be used to put people into space right so you can see how war and technology sometimes go hand in hand and that's probably where they're going to be getting to here I think as they they get going forward so be cool so it looks like we're getting closer and closer to actual actually getting to space here but nice to get the little more uh lessons about the enlightenment and uh, the industrial revolution great stuff that has its hands in basically every modern event you can you can tie back to that so that's important and i'm glad they're able to to add that so all right awesome okay original video link again was down below make sure you give that the support over there and yeah awesome um so a few shout outs again on the way I said earlier, uh, if you're a gamer, definitely join up on my gaming channel. I do uh, mostly on their non-history game related stuff over there. And this on my history 
gaming related stuff i kind of keep on my main channel here but uh come join that there's a link down below join that and you can come join our community and have some fun uh with some gaming stuff over there all right discord link is down below as well patreon all those good things thank you for supporting the channel in whatever way that you are currently doing and we'll see you guys next time bye